to the 103rd Psalm. We're going to do something I've had on my heart for several weeks. A little reluctant about doing it just because it's different. But uh, I feel like that it's of the Lord. And uh, so I, I want to share that with you tonight. And then we're going to go over to Ecclesiastes in our study. Psalm 103. <clears throat> There's so many times that you know, we, we come to a place in life that it's not easy. A, a day that maybe things are not going our way. A day when there's trouble, whether it be with us, uh, whether it be emotional, whether it be physical, mental, spiritual, whatever the case might be. A lot of times that if we're not careful, we'll just get overwhelmed in things. We'll forget who God is and uh, really what God is able to do for us. And uh, this is a chapter uh, that speaks... Of really all the reasons we have uh, to to bless the Lord and uh, what's been on my mind and uh, I'd like to do this at least on on Sunday night uh, maybe at least th this year the year 2020 is uh, I'd like for us to recite this together every Sunday night for, for the course of the year and I believe by the end of December we'll know it by heart and it'll be something that we can uh, we can recall back to our minds. It'll be something that uh, in, in those times of difficulty, those times of trouble, when it seems like everything is, is falling apart around us, that, that, that we can go back to this and that we can remember what the Lord uh, has done uh, for us. And uh, it's always good. The Word of God is to be hidden in our hearts. Not only as the psalmist said that we wouldn't sin against Him, uh, but uh, the Word of God uh, is, is that, that sword uh, of the Spirit that Paul talked about that we're to clothe ourselves in. And uh, I know it's going to be a little, uh, it'll be a little rough tonight around the edges, but I would encourage you to do this. Well, I'm not going to make you do it. If you don't want to do it, uh, I'm not going to make you do it. But I think it'll be good for all of us to let's learn this song. And uh, no better way to do it than to just recite it uh, together. Again, if we can do this every Sunday night, I promise by the end of the year, we won't even, you won't even need to open your Bible. And you'll have it uh, memorized. So uh, all who would, uh, again, we'll just, uh, I know it'll be rough tonight, but you just follow along with me and just re say it out loud. Let, let's recite this together. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as the flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those that remember his commandments to do them. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of the word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his host, ye ministers of his, that do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, and all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. What a wonderful chapter that is. Really just to get in the depths of it. I know we're not even going to try to deal with it tonight. I'm teaching in, in no way. But uh, just to 
uh, all the reasons that we have to, to bless the Lord and uh, to praise Him in our life. So let's do that if you would. Let's do that. Try to do that every Sunday night. Won't do it on Sunday morning or Wednesday night, but each Sunday night, let's recite that together. And uh, I believe it'll do us some good. Let's go over to the book of Ecclesiastes now. Uh, we want to continue our study through Ecclesiastes uh, in chapter 6. Ecclesiastes chapter 6. That was enjoyable. Enjoyed that. It's good to recite the Word of God together. Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Now last week that we looked at the text in the latter part of chapter 5. and uh, The Koheleth Solomon, the, the preacher, he dealt with two subjects. And uh, one was uh, injustice and oppression of the poor by the powerful. And uh, then the second thing he dealt with was the vanity of riches. And we tried to spend some time on that, that I, I had my board up here and uh, we said that riches can't do, there's four things that riches can't do that are mentioned here in chapter 5. They can't bring security, they can't bring satisfaction, they can't bring peace of mind, and you can't take them with you uh, when you go. And so Solomon summed it up at the end of chapter 5 by exhorting us to labor, but also to enjoy the good of our labor and to acknowledge all that as the gift of God. And so tonight, let's deal with the first nine verses of chapter 6. Some of this you may seem, you, it may seem to you be repetitive, and some of it is. And uh, yet, that uh, again, Solomon is stressing some things that uh, need to be stressed. So uh, let's begin reading in verse 1. He said, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and it is common among men, a man to whom God hath given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wanteth nothing for, all his, for his soul of all that he desireth. Yet God giveth him not power to eat thereof, but a stranger eateth it. This is vanity, and it is an evil disease. If a man begat an hundred children, and live many years, so that the days of his years be many, and his soul be not filled with good, and also that he have no burial, I say that an untimely birth is better than he. For he cometh in with vanity, and departeth in darkness, and his name shall be covered with darkness. Moreover, he hath not seen the sun, nor known anything. This hath more rest than the other. Yea, though he live a thousand years twice told, yet hath he seen no good. Do not all go to one place? All the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled. For what hath the wise more than the fool? And what hath the poor that knoweth to walk before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. And I want to stop there in verse 9. That we'll not try to cover the last three verses of this chapter uh, tonight. Now, there's, as, I, as I begin to read over this chapter this week, preparing for the study tonight, there's, there's really two words that jumped out at me in verse 2. And I feel like that that's the theme of, of this particular chapter, at least the first part of this chapter uh, that we're dealing with tonight. And the, those, the two words that it, that it would find in verse 6... Uh, well, let's just read verse 2 again. He said, A man to whom God hath given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wanteth nothing for his soul of all that he desireth, yet God giveth him not power to eat thereof, but a stranger eateth it. This is vanity. It is an evil disease. The two words, and they really, it's the same word, just used in a little bit different manner, is the word eat. The word eat. I believe that's the theme of this particular chapter. Not eat in the physical sense of what we do. But what does the word eat here mean? What is it figurative of? Let's read it again. He said, A man to whom God had given riches, wealth, and honor, so that he wanteth nothing for his soul of all that he desireth, yet God giveth him not the power to eat thereof, but a stranger eateth it. Okay? I see some partake or to enjoy. And that's what I really want to deal with tonight is that, that thought of enjoying. Enjoying. I believe that Solomon here in this particular passage, these first nine verses of this chapter, he's considering where your joy comes from. Where your joy comes from. Now, uh, he, he goes back in verse 1 and he says this. He says, there's an evil which I've seen under the sun and it's common among men. What he's saying here is this is another one of those things that just doesn't seem fair. Things that just don't seem fair. Things that seem to be uh, unjust. 
And he had already mentioned things uh, earlier uh, in this book. Uh, and, and what he talks about here, the thing that he sees that just doesn't seem to be fair is what we find in verse 2. That a man, that God would give him riches, wealth, and honor, and he would want nothing. There's nothing that he would lack. And yet notice what it says about him. Yet God giveth him not the power to eat thereof, but a stranger eateth it. This is vanity, and it is an evil disease. So he says what doesn't seem to be fair. Remember the last chapter, last week we looked at this, that people look at things like injustice and oppression and they say, well, if God is a just God, if he's really who, who you say he is, why does he allow these things to take place? Why does he allow the poor to be oppressed? Why does he allow you know, bad things to, to happen to good people? Why, why do all these things take place? And I believe that's what the Kohelet is saying here, that, that it, it doesn't seem fair that, that a man would heap up riches and wealth and honor and yet that he'd never be able to enjoy those things how many of you have seen living examples of that we all have haven't we you live long enough you have and I was thinking back over my life this week and uh, I know there were several instances I remember just as a boy growing up of, of several individuals that I went to church with and uh, of course my daddy being a pastor that uh, we didn't always go to the same church growing up. As he moved, we would move. But I saw it in several different places that men would work 25, 30, 35 years and come to that place of retirement and be in good health and maybe have great plans. We're going to travel. We're going to do this. We're going to, we're going to do that. Even sometimes, Brother Willie, they, you know, they would work past 25 years. Well, I'm going to work to 30 or I'm going to work for 35 because that will give me a little better retirement. Brother Kyle, I've seen some of them within six months of retirement. We were going to their funeral. That's sad, isn't it? That's sad. You see that... He planned and he planned, he prepared, he sacrificed even those that would work longer than they had to because they wanted to be set in their future and then not able to enjoy it. Whether it would be, again, death, whether it would be some sort of health problem that their health would fail, maybe it would be a situation in their family that, that there would be someone maybe that needed to be taken care of and they not be able to enjoy uh, those things and then he said what happens he says they're not able to enjoy it but a stranger enjoys it it goes on to somebody else and they get to enjoy it hold our place and let's go over to the book of Luke I hope I can get this across this is another one of those chapters it's not the easiest to understand and uh, not the easiest to teach Luke chapter 12, we have a great example of this very thing, and it's probably unnecessary to read it, but it's good to read the Word of God, so let's read it. Luke chapter 12, verse 16, I'm going to jump in the middle of this, I know there was a question that was asked to the Lord, and uh, that's the context in which that this parable is given. Uh, nevertheless, for our purposes tonight, it's, we can begin in verse 16 and we won't lose anything. He said here, and he spake a parable unto them saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and I will build greater and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But, verse 20, but, things are changing. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? They're going to be a strangers, aren't they? They'll be somebody else's. Somebody else will enjoy the fruit of your labor. 
So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now I understand the point in which that, that Christ was, was making here was the, 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 the point of, of, of really focusing on the, the spiritual things, not necessarily the, the material things. But it's a great example. This man, that he worked, that he labored, and, and he wasn't a lazy man. He had a good year. And uh, he said, I'm going to put all this back. And then I'm going to live off of it. And I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to labor, 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 labor. And then at the end, then I'll enjoy all these things. Let's go back to where we were in the book of Ecclesiastes. So this man looked for joy, didn't he? That's what he was searching for. He's searching for joy. But his life ended before that he could enjoy these things that he had laid up. And so evidently this rich man that we just read about, in his life, he, he looked and he searched and he longed for joy, for satisfaction, for peace, for contentment. And he looked out ahead and he said, finally I'm going to have that. Well, I enjoy all of these riches. And so Solomon is going to teach us something here. He said at the end of verse 2, he said, This is vanity, and it is an evil disease. I believe what Solomon is trying to get across to us in this, this passage is this, that we need to enjoy the blessings of life now. We need to thank God for all of his blessings that he bestows upon us now. We don't need to plan to live. We need to live now. We need to be satisfied with what he gives us now and use it for his honor and glory rather than just lay it up and lay it up and lay it up and lay it up and say, well, I'll enjoy things later when I have what I want. He says, no, you can, have, you can find joy now in life. So in these first two verses, we find that wealth doesn't automatically bring joy. And notice how I said that because at, at the end, I want to try to bring this around. Wealth doesn't automatically bring joy. You see, th this man had riches, wealth, and honor, but he was never able to enjoy it. You remember Mr. Rockefeller? Richest man in the world eating crackers because his stomach couldn't handle anything else. He had all of that, and God didn't, get, God didn't give him at that time in his life the, the power to enjoy it. But thankfully, he, had, he made a change in his life, and later he was able to enjoy it. Let's go down to verse 3. Let's read verses 3 to 5. There's a, so in the first two verses, Solomon says that wealth doesn't automatically bring joy. Now let's read verses 3 to 5. If a man begat a hundred children and lived many years so that the days of his years be many, and his soul be not filled with good, and also that he have no burial. I say that an untimely birth is better than he, for he cometh in with vanity and departeth in darkness, and his name shall be covered with darkness. Moreover, he hath not seen the sun, nor known anything. This hath more rest than the other. There's two men, or two individuals that are contrasted here. There's a man that has a hundred children and lives many years. Now, we know that it's, it would be impossible for a man and a woman uh, to have a hundred children, biologically. Uh, th but Solomon's getting across a point here, and that is this. In verses 3 through 5, family doesn't automatically bring joy. He just talked about that wealth didn't automatically bring joy in the first two verses. Now he says that family doesn't automatically bring joy. This man had a hundred children, and he lived many years I don't know, 100 children might be a lot of stress. <laughs> That's not what Solomon's saying. He's, he, he, he's, look, Solomon's assuming here that, his writer, that, his, that the readers of this would understand that children equal joy. And I think most of you that sit here tonight would testify, would agree that children equal joy. Jesus talked about the, the woman in childbirth that, you know, she experiences all the pain and, and it's so awful, but she forgets all of that because of the joy when the child comes into the world. Uh, we had uh, dinner or lunch today with 
uh, Brother Kevin, Sister Sarah, and uh, they're mighty close, uh, Lord willing, to, to have a child. And, and uh, the joy that will be in their hearts when that child is born is probably going to be the gr greatest joy that they've had since the day that they trusted Christ. Lord willing, they have that, that help, healthy little Blakely's born in the world. It will be joyous for them. And it should be. And so he says here, that joy times a hundred. Have a hundred children. And then live many years. So the days of his years be many. But you see here, there's something different. His soul be not filled with good. And here's the sad thing. And also that he have no burial. Uh-oh. What does that mean? He have no burial. Who's responsible for burying the parents? The children. Was it King Jehoram? Uh, I believe it's in uh, Second Chronicles. I have to go back and look. Jehoram was one of the kings... Uh, I can't remember if it was Judah or I'm thinking Judah. But it may have been Israel. But the, the statement was made about him that he, di he died without being desired. That'd be awful, wouldn't it? Nobody cared. Nobody cared when he died. His children didn't care when he died. Those around him, he was a very wicked man. And because of that, that nobody cared when he died. Nobody there to bury him. This man had a hundred children. And yet he died, and there was nobody there to bury him. There were some issues there somewhere, weren't there? Maybe he was a man that, the Bible says that we can provoke our children to wrath. And there's so many ways to do that. But maybe he was a man that provoked his children to wrath. They didn't want anything to do with him. So for that man, children didn't equal joy. In fact, notice the comparison that's made. It says that an untimely birth is better than he. An untimely birth, the, the Greek word means abortion. And not in the sense of, you know, somebody going down to a center somewhere and, and having a baby aborted. It just means the, the, the baby does, does not live. We, we call it stillborn. He said a stillborn baby is better than the man who would live many years and have a hundred children and then come down to the end of his life. He'd have no burial. He'd have no joy from his children. Why is it better? It says in verse 4, the stillborn baby, he cometh in with vanity and departeth in darkness, never sees the light of day, and his name shall be covered with darkness. I read this. I didn't know this before I, I read and studying for the message tonight that when a Jewish family had a stillborn child, they would not name the child. Even if it was full term and it was born, born dead, they would not name the child. You know why? Because they wanted to be able to forget that sorrow. And by putting a name to it, it caused it to be remembered. And so here he says, his name would be covered with darkness. You see that? There'd be no name given. Verse 5, Why is the stillborn child better? He hath not seen the sun, nor known anything. This hath more rest than the other. No stress, no disappointment, no heartache of seeing your children forsake you. He said the stillborn better than that. So family doesn't automatically bring joy. So let's think about the two that we've looked at so far. Wealth doesn't automatically bring joy, and family doesn't automatically uh, bring joy. All right? Verse 6. Yea, though he live a thousand years, twice told. We don't have anybody recorded in the scriptures that lived to be 2,000 years old. But he said, though he live a thousand years, twice told, yet hath he seen no good. Do not all go to one place. So the third thing he mentions here that doesn't automatically bring joy is longevity. We all want to live a long time. Nobody wants to die a premature death. We all want to live. 
But he said, if you live 2,000 years, he said, that doesn't automatically bring joy. Because he said, in the end, you die. You go to the grave. He, he didn't say that everybody goes to heaven or hell. Don't look at it that way. But I'll go to one place. I'll go to the grave. I'll die. Whether you're 2,000 years old or you're two years old. You die, you go to the grave. And then the last thing he says in verse 7, All the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled. For what hath the wise more than the fool? And what hath the poor that knoweth to walk before the living? So then verses 7 and 8, he says this, that labor doesn't automatically bring joy in life. To get out to labor and to work, you may remember he talked about that in the first couple of chapters, that it's vanity and vexation of spirit under certain conditions. So wealth doesn't automatically bring labor, uh, bring joy. A family doesn't automatically bring joy. Longevity doesn't always automatically bring joy. And labor doesn't automatically bring joy. But the statement is made in verse 9. This is the advice or the, the summation. Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. Let's think about that statement for a minute. Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. There's an old axiom, I guess would be the proper term for it. A bird in the hands worth two in the bush. It's better to have a little and to grasp it than to be seeking after something greater and it slip away. And that's exactly what Solomon is telling us here in verse 9. The better is the sight of the eyes. To have a little and be able to see it, to be able to grasp it, and be able to hold it. He said, better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. He said, it's better just to have a little and to enjoy it than to dream about having much and never attain it. I think we can describe that one word, contentment, isn't it? Just to be content with what you have. So let's, let's go back to this thought of joy for just a minute. He said none of these things automatically brought joy. They failed to bring joy in life. But there's one reason these things failed to bring joy in life. And that's because they all were missing an ingredient, weren't they? And we know what that ingredient is. That ingredient is the Lord Jesus Christ. When you add the Lord Jesus Christ to all four of these things, you have joy. You have fulfillment. You have peace. You have meaning. When Christ is added to the mix, the psalmist made this statement in Psalm 16 and verse 11, he said, in thy presence, in the presence of the Lord, that there's fullness of joy. You find joy in his presence. So let's briefly, let's look back at these four things and then we'll, we'll come to a close. Let's, let's start with wealth. He said, wealth doesn't automatically bring joy. Let's, uh, let's mention Rockefeller again. I mentioned him earlier. Uh, there was a time in Rockefeller's life, he, uh, according to what I've read, even though he was a saved man, he had the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ was not his Lord. Christ desires to be both Lord and Christ. He desires to rule and reign in our lives. So it was a time that, that, that Rockefeller, that wealth wasn't something that brought him joy. What did it bring him? It brought him pain. It brought him sickness. It brought him anxiety. It brought him heartache. Remember, they'd already printed these obituary up. He's, you know, any day, he'll be gone. But remember that he came to a, play, a place to surrender his life to the Lord. You can be saved and not have surrendered your life to the Lord. Remember, what was Rockefeller in it for? Remember the insurance policy on the load of grain we talked about going across Lake Michigan? What, 150 bucks? Oh, he was in it for himself to heap up. But there came the time in his life when the Lord revealed unto him, you need to listen to me. And rather this being heaped up for you, he said, let it be a ministry. Let it be a blessing to others. And all of a sudden, what did Rockefeller find in his wealth? Joy. 
because of the addition of the Lord Jesus Christ making the decisions now. All of a sudden that, they brought so much grief and so much heartache, now brought, brought wonderful blessings. Brought great joy. There's so many people in this world today that believe just by doing good deeds, by helping, by charitable giving, by these things that you'll be accepted to heaven. Don't ever believe that. But when you do those things, being led of God as a saved individual, doesn't it bring joy to be able to help? So he found joy in his wealth because that now Christ was at the center of his life. The second one was family. Remember the man that he, he lived all that, he had all those children and lived all that long period of time? And yet come the end of his life and he'd even get no proper burial from his children? There's no joy in that. But we can find true joy in our children when? When we have the proper outlook on our family and on our children. What is, why did God even institute the family? So that generation after generation after generation that the, that the message the revelation of God the revelation of God to mankind could be transmitted from generation to generation so that we could teach them that they would set their hope in God. And when we look at our children in that way, and not as some pawn or, or, or some slave, or any other reason, we look at our children as that these are, are human beings that God has, has entrusted us with, and He's given us the, the task and the responsibility to teach them and to train them the things of the Lord. Man, all of a sudden our children are a source of joy, aren't they? Why? Because Christ is infused. He's infused. Some of you have gotten to this point in your life. I, I'm not yet. I look forward to it. I hope the Lord will allow me to live and see it if it's His will. But I think it's got to be joyous to put that time and effort into your children and then to see them come to trust Christ as their Savior. And then you begin to see them walk in the fear of God in their life. You begin to see them make decisions on their own. Put a price on that. And then maybe see them have children and to see them teach their children as you taught them and, and that be passed from generation to generation. You see the Lord bless. Man, that's joy. Great joy. The third thing was longevity. Longevity doesn't automatically bring joy. But I want to mention or remind you of two people in the Bible. Or three. Uh, another one just came to my mind. You remember when Jesus was taken to the temple? There was an old man by the name of Simeon there. And he had a ministry there. And there was an 84-year-old woman there named Anna. And she had a ministry there. They had realized something. And that is that he who hath began a good work in me will perform it until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. So many elderly people come to the place in their life to, you know, to wonder, why am I even still here? Why is the Lord not just taking me on home? And I may get to that point when I get old. I hope I don't. I hope I don't. They had found joy in their longevity that there was still a work for them to do, that they could minister. Remember uh, Dorcas? What was her other name? Tabitha? What, she the one that made coats? I think she was old. I don't know. I think she couldn't do a whole lot, but she, she made coats for, for ladies. And her life was joyful because that she was following Christ in her life. Caleb was the other one I wanted to mention. Caleb is an old man. They ask him, what, uh, what do you want your inheritance to be? 
He said, you see that mountain up there with the giants on it? I want that one. And he went up there and he took it. Joy in longevity. They found that because of the influence of Christ in their life. The last thing is labor. Labor. It's not always easy in the workplace. I know that. You know that. But we can find joy in realizing that God has blessed us with the ability and the strength to get out and to do this and to provide for my family, to make a living for my family, to feed my kids and my, my, my spouse and, and to put, put food on the table, put clothes on their back. And not only that, but God's put me here as, as, a, as salt and light. That I'm here to allow the light of Jesus Christ to shine forth in me. I've got a mission field here. All of a sudden that workplace, that place of labor, it's not such a miserable place anymore, but it can be a place of joy. All because of Christ. The influence of Jesus Christ. The, in, the missing ingredient being put in. Today are you allowing Christ, child of God, are you allowing Christ to be your Lord? Are you walking in the light of Christ? Or are you trying to find joy and satisfaction apart? Apart from the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ. Solomon said it's vanity. It's vanity. All of these things have come up empty. There'll be no joy. But when Christ is infused, it'll change everything. May we allow Him to be not only our Savior, but to be our Lord. Let's have a verse of a song. If there be some